Hello, and welcome to the People's Strategy for the Future of Work Virtual Conference. We're really glad you're here. This is our last major session of the day. We do have a roadmap session after this, which we really want you, attend, you to attend. Um, but here we are going to talk with Edie Goldberg, uh, who is going to speak about designing a winning employee experience, HR's blueprint. Um, Edie is a nationally recognized expert in talent management and organizational development. She practices uh her practice focuses on designing human resource processes and programs to attract, engage, develop, and retain employees. So without further ado, Edie, I'll let you have the floor. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Thank you to Engagedly for inviting me to be part of your Friday. Um, and so let's get into it. I love this quote from Jacob Morgan to kind of set the stage. And I think it's really important as we begin this session that we talk about why is employee experience important? Uh, and so Jacob Morgan says, in a world where money is no longer the primary motivating factor for employees, focusing on the employee experience is the most promising competitive advantage that the organization can create. Now, employees today do not take a job or stay with the company simply because of the pay. They do so because they like the people that they work with. They feel good about the company. They're learning and growing. And because the employee experience is positive for them. Now, given a very tight labor market, companies need to differentiate themselves based on that employee experience. Yes. Pay has got to be competitive, but there is so much more that makes a difference. For example, a recent research report from the Center for Creative Leadership found that women were more likely to accept a job offer or stay with a company if they had meaningful work where they could make a difference, where they had flexibility in where, when, and how they work, and when they had visibility and were recognized for their accomplishments. Other factors impacting uh, the importance of the employee experience include the fact that millennials and Gen Z employees who now make up the majority of your workforce, they expect to have a say in how things are going. So they wanna have their voices heard. And given how technology has created an expectation for personalized experiences, a la Amazon and Netflix, we expect the same kind of personalization in our workplace. Employees expect their systems to be smarter. And not often talked about, but really critical, is the explosion of use of social media to make negative employee experiences go viral. Recently, we have seen companies laying off their employees via Zoom calls or email. Bad idea. The impact of the power that employees have on a company's brand image requires companies to be more thoughtful in every employee interaction to protect their brand reputation. Your company employment brand will be driven by that employee experience. Now, for organizations to excel at the employee experience, it's got to listen to its people at each stage of the employee life cycle. And they have to, and then create personalized experiences. So everything that an employee does, learns, sees, and feels contributes to that employee experience. Often when people talk about the employee experience, they discuss the experience at each stage of the employee life cycle. So what was the experience of being recruited to your company? Were they responsive and helpful or did they ghost you at times? Was the hiring process long and drawn out or was it rigorous yet thoughtfully designed to make the best use of everyone's time to make a timely decision? On your first day of work, did they tell you, Sorry, your manager is out traveling, your computer is not quite ready yet, but here are five manuals that you can read to get you started. 
Or did they make sure that you had all the resources that you needed on day one? And did they intentionally connect you to the right people and information to make you feel welcomed and part of that team? For Engage, did they connect you to how your work connects to the larger mission of your organization? Is your performance management process a draconian ordeal that everyone hates? Or are you clear on your goals, supported by your manager, and getting regular timely feedback that you need to improve your performance in a way that lifts you up and doesn't drag you down? Do you get the opportunities that you need to continuously learn and grow? And when you leave your company, are employees told, hey, don't let the door hit you on the way out. You're a traitor. Don't come back. Or do they exit you gracefully? Do they connect you to the alumni network? And assuming you left them, do they let you know that if the grass isn't greener on the other side, we'd love to have you come back? Now, while that employee experience is all about the various touch points you have with your employees through the employee life cycle, the blueprint that I want to share with you focuses on six areas that really cross these life cycle moments. So we're going to talk about these one by one. We're going to start with listening. Then we're going to talk about the employee manager relationship. We're going to talk about the importance of seamless technology, the workplace environment, the importance of culture, and of course, measuring and iterating as you go along. So these icons will take us through our journey, and you'll be able to track where we are by this blue bar on the top. And so these different icons will light up as we go through the different phases that we're talking about. You'll see that we'll spend a fair amount of time on that employee manager relationship. It's critical that we start with listening as the first step. And as I mentioned, the younger generations in our workplace, they expect to have a say. And creating an ongoing listening program will be important to reflect their desire to provide input. But before I get into the specifics regarding this area, I want to listen to you. So, Jackie, if you can launch our first poll, I want to know, does your company have an ongoing listening process? That might be an annual employee survey, a periodic topic-focused survey, or a daily or monthly poll survey. And you see here, I've given you a variety of options. The first is that easy yes, no. The second uh, choice is if it's yes, do you have an annual process, but you don't do much with the results? Do you have an annual process or a little bit more frequently, and you do active action planning? Or do you, do you measure employee sentiment many times during the year and take action? So assuming that you've all had enough time to respond. All right. Can we see those results? There we go. All right. Um, so almost 30% of you don't have a listening process. So as we get into our next section, I want you to think about how companies are employing this. And it's important to your employee experience because people really do want to have their voices heard. P people are still doing employee engagement surveys, but not really following up on the actions that they are learning from. So that's really, really important. If you take the step to hear what your employees have to say, Following it up with action of what you've learned is really important to getting them to participate in that survey again the next time. Because if they just participate and you don't do anything, they're going to stop participating because they're, they will feel like their voice you know, isn't really being paid attention to. And I love seeing that 35% of people here um, are saying that they are both listening frequently and taking action. That is the gold standard. So kudos to you guys who are doing that. 
Jackie, I see there's some stuff in the chat. Is there anything that I need to address before we move on? Um, no, uh, we, we will be recording the session and sending it out afterwards. So if anybody needs to drop or cannot stay, we will be sending it through your email. Please stay. It's way more fun because I can answer your questions as we go along. Okay, so how are companies listening? While many are still conducting those annual surveys, the pace of change in organizations today really make that cadence too slow to get the information that you need. Now, some of my clients have moved to doing this twice a year so that they can actually see the impact of their actions on the organization more quickly. An even more popular trend, given the technologies that we have available to us today, is to break those surveys down into smaller bites and do what we call pulse surveys. Now, often a pulse survey will reach out for a small number of items to a randomized subset of employees in the organization. So different questions get asked to different groups of employees at times. And that provides a good flow of data for the leaders to respond to without over-surveying your employees. Several technology companies are now actually encouraging a daily check-in question. That question might change based on the issue that an organization is tackling. But answering one question at the end of the day doesn't seem as intrusive as completing, let's say, a 50-item survey or 20-item survey, whatever it is that might take some time. 360 feedback is another form of listening to how employees feel about their leadership um, or how they feel about their teammates that they're collaborating with. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about kind of the old school focus groups, which really can help us to provide more nuanced and detailed feedback when organizations are struggling with one particular issue. For example, one of my clients, they knew that they needed to shift the culture to both improve employee engagement and reduce turnover. We conducted focus groups with a representative sample of employees across the company so that we could dig deep and understand the root causes of some of the cultural issues that we could then develop a detailed action plan to address uh, the appropriate changes that were needed to shift their culture. Employees loved being engaged this way. But what was especially important was that we shared the high level findings of those focus groups with those employees. And then they heard the action plan of what would follow based on the input that they got. The center of the employee experience is the relationship that they have with their manager. Your goal is to help develop a relationship between your employees and their managers that drive performance and retain your top talent. Helping your managers understand their role in this is key. That's why we've seen such a huge uptick in the in focus on uh, for the past couple of years on developing managers. Companies are really seeing how important that manager is to this, this employee experience. So let's talk through the four ways that the employee-manager relationship sits at the heart of the employee experience. I'm going to talk about goal setting, recognition, creating belonging and connection, and connecting employees to opportunities to learn and grow. I'll talk about these one-on-one. -on -one. According to Gallup, only about 41% of U.S. workers strongly agree that their job description aligns to what they're actually asked to do. They lack clarity on what's expected of them. Last week, as I was preparing for a pa another panel discussion on 2024 trends in HR, this issue of clarity also came up. As HR leaders, we all know that setting specific, difficult, and measurable goals is important to motivating and driving performance. But so often, managers don't set goals, or they set vague goals, or the goals and priorities kind of shift like the wind, leaving employees to lack the clarity that they need to work on what's most important. 
managers have to provide clarity to their employees so that employees can focus their energy on the right tasks that drive the business forward. A good goal setting process can help create meaning for employees. When they know how their goals and their work supports those higher level company goals, they can find purpose and meaning in their work. Managers need to create alignment, not only on what employees should be doing to drive the organization forward, but also how they should go about doing their work in ways that reinforce the company culture. And finally, and most importantly, goal setting needs to be a collaborative partnership between the manager and employee. I was shocked to read some recent research that said only 30% of employees said that their managers involved them in goal setting. But for those managers that do involve employees in the process, they had 3.6 times greater employee engagement. And since we know that engaged employees are more productive, we can see how important collaboratively setting goals is to performance. Think about the last time you put your heart and soul into a project or a presentation. You molded it into something that you were really proud of, and you absolutely nailed that execution. That feeling of accomplishment is uplifting, but it's multiplied exponentially when others take notice. The simple act of acknowledging achievement is a major boost for employee morale and performance, and that's why employee recognition is so critical. When you reward employees for their contributions, they feel ownership and pride, and they're willing to work just as hard on that next project. Recognition connects them to the organization, it elevates their performance, and it increases the likelihood that they'll stay with your company. The manager is more often than not the source of that recognition, although peer-to-peer recognition is just as validating particularly if you respect the people that you work with. When employees feel valued for who they are and what they do, and they're treated like more than just cogs in a machine, they act differently in ways that positively impact their teams and the organization. Workers want to feel like they're valued and they belong. According to recent research from Gallup, only a quarter of employees receive recognition or praise for the work that they've done in the previous week. If that figure doubled, so only half of the people said that they got praise or recognition for what they'd done in the last week, the organization would see a 9% improvement in productivity, a 22% decrease in safety incidents, and a 22% decrease in absenteeism. Pretty good. In Glassdoor's recent employee appreciation survey, 53% of people said feeling more appreciation from their boss would help them stay longer with their company. And while having a formal recognition uh, program is great, and it totally pays off, There are some things that managers can do that show appreciation for their employees that don't cost a dime. Listen to your employees, put down the phone, turn away from your computer, and give them your full attention. Tell your employees what you value about them. Acknowledge their human value. Managers can do that proactively, and it doesn't have to be tied to a specific accomplishment. Check in to see how people are doing. There's a quote that's often attributed to Teddy Roosevelt that says, people don't care how much you know them until they know how much you care. Recognition is important. Now, pulling on this thread of checking in on people, which acknowledges them, It also has the the impact of connecting people on your team and creating a sense of belonging. Brene Brown has described the heart of connection as being the 
energy that is created between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. I really learned about the importance of belonging during the pandemic. Pat Waters, who was then the CHRO at UKG, told a story about how when we were telling our managers to check in with your employees during the pandemic, it wasn't just like, are they working? It was like, how are you personally doing? How is this impacting you? How is your whole family being impacted? And that impact of checking in dramatically increased belonging within their organization. An HBR study found that belonging can mean a 56% increase in job performance, a 50% drop in turnover risk, and a 75% reduction in sick days. But 40% of employees today feel isolated at work. They don't have a sense of belonging and being connected. Managers are at the core of creating this connection through their interactions with their employees. Managers need to help create moments that matter for their employees. And that takes thought and intention. It doesn't come naturally to managers, but it can be built as a habit through reminders and positive reinforcement. When managers provide employees with opportunities to learn, grow, and develop their skills, they're more likely to be engaged, committed, and satisfied with their jobs, leading to a positive employee experience. So as a manager, or are your managers, showing employees that learning and growth is valued by your organization? Do they encourage it? And do they help employees make time for it? Do managers help make learning accessible to employees? Sometimes there are so many different things that we can do within our companies. Employees don't know how to navigate it. So a manager is there to help be that navigating beacon. Managers need to help make the training that's available relevant to employees, whether it be to their current job or future role that they're seeking. And again, lining the learning and growth opportunities with the employee's career aspirations, as well as the company's strategic objectives. Where's the company need to grow and how might that cue the employee into where they need to learn and grow? And of course, when we talk about learning and growth, we have to talk about the frequency of opportunities people get for learning and growth. And that often has to do with the feedback that they get relative to their performance. Or what I like to talk about is how our managers feed forwarding. How are they coaching their employees for success and uh, connecting to their employees? That has a really positive impact on the employee experience. I'm going to move on to our next section, unless there are any key questions I need to answer. Nope. Okay. No questions so far. Great. So next, we want to talk about uh, leveraging seamless technology to reduce friction. Boy, can technology produce friction. Many companies suffer from way too many technology systems, especially systems that are disconnected. So every time an employee moves from one system to the next, they have to sign in again, and it drives employees crazy. So we're so used to systems that know us and our preferences, we expect our work systems to have the same amount of personalization. If I put in a request to change my name, why isn't the system into it that I got married or divorced? And maybe it's a great time to relook at my selected benefits of beneficiaries. As an employee, I shouldn't have to think through all those details, but the system should know me well enough to prompt me. Matching you to a doctor in your healthcare network that's within 10 miles of your home is an example of AI at work. It's more technically known as discriminative AI, and we've actually been leveraging these types of AI systems for quite a while now. The new innovation, of course, is generative AI that's based on large language models. And that's what's absolutely exploded in the workplace since AI, open AI introduced this new technology in November of 2022. A few weeks ago, I was at a two-day conference that focused on the AI revolution. And we saw examples of really sophisticated ways that generative AI can automate routine work. 
Kathleen Hogan, the CHRO of Microsoft, said it's like each employee having their very own personal assistant. At Microsoft, they say it's about having more joy and less toil in your work. And we're seeing a lot of advancements in using AI in things like summarizing feedback for performance reviews or helping managers do things like write job descriptions or help provide specific feedback to employees. When used right, these technologies can actually help de-bias our practices by calling out language that's either not gender neutral or potentially offensive to individuals. The bottom line is help your employees learn how to leverage these technologies to help them learn to be more effective and efficient. And as we look to employ new technologies in the workplace, it's important that they're designed with the end user in mind. Intuitive employee self-service options will all help us stay on hold for less time and quickly get the information that we need to move on to more important work, like focusing on our customers. Integrating our systems and moving data into one easy to view dashboard is the latest way that we in HR can help our managers stay uh, on top of how their employees are doing. So if your company conducts daily or monthly employee sentiment checks, having a manager dashboard that summarizes your employee sentiment data will help those leaders understand what they need to pay attention to and what's working well. Dashboards are also a really great way to quickly update managers on the progress their employees are making against their goals. And that helps managers know where their assistance is needed in helping the team overcome obstacles to success. The workplace environment, of course, refers to both the company office as well as the home office if employees can work from home. So now our last poll, just a quick one here. One of the biggest frustrations pre-COVID was people couldn't find an open meeting room to have a meeting. So now that companies are bringing employees back to the office after hiring a lot of people during the pandemic, or maybe they've reduced their footprint because of remote and hybrid work, I think the situation is starting to rear its ugly head again. So I want to know, have you been frustrated in the past because you couldn't find a meeting room for your team to meet in? It might be, yes. Totally frustrating. No, I can always find a meeting room for my team or hey, I'm just not in charge of that. So I have absolutely no idea. I wanted to give you an out here. We've got about 50% participation. We'll wait for a couple more to get in there. Okay, guys, come on. We all have to participate so that we know how people are feeling. Um, it's just a quick one, an easy answer. And it's okay to say, I'm just not in charge of that, so I have no clue. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and see those results. All right. Sure. Ta-da. 44%. Uh, yeah, that, that is part of the employee experience, right? Um, I'm glad to hear an equal number of you can always find a meeting room, and there are some of you who just don't have to worry about that, so it's lucky for you. Okay, we're going to move on. So you may not have given the space that you work in much thought, but trust me, architects and psychologists have been conducting a tremendous amount of research into what makes a space a healthy and productive workplace. And I'm going to start by talking about your company office, because that's the traditional place where we all work. And this really has to do, your space design has to do with those collaborative spaces, like meeting rooms, solitary workspaces, and rooms to have confidential conversations. Airbnb is the epitome of a company that gave a lot of thought to its space design. They designed their offices to represent their brand and their ethos that you should belong anywhere. Their company offices are designed as neighborhoods that mirror some of the designs of the properties on their platform. Their workspace options exemplify that sharing economy, which is the core concept of their company mission. Space is designed to fit a need or a mood. And while people do have an assigned desk, everyone's got a laptop and a phone, so they're encouraged to work in the space that works for them. 
If you need a quiet space to knock something out, go to a quiet room. If you're working on a creative project, you can work in an open space where people are walking around and maybe can provide input. Do you need a whiteboard because you're brainstorming or a desk with lots of outlets to plug in all your devices? Or do you need a big screen because you're going to be working in a, you know, a virtual meeting and everybody needs a place at their uh, station to plug their computer in because we're all going to be on a computer screen? Believe it or not, natural light and plants have a really positive impact on mood and well-being at work. If your workplace is in a bottom basement with overhead fluorescent lights where no plant could possibly survive, how is a human supposed to thrive in that environment? Natural light and plants have been shown to improve productivity, mood, employee satisfaction and creativity, as well as reducing stress. Now, if your job lends itself to being done remotely, then how your home office is set up is also an important part of the employee experience. Does the employee have the equipment that they need? Do they have internet, computers, webcams? Is your workspace ergonomically set up? Or are you like my sister? I hate to tell you this. She sits on her bed in her bedroom with her legs crossed, leaning over her laptop, and my back just hurts thinking about how her office space at home is set up. Um, do you have dedicated space to work? Or are you constantly navigating around the kids that are running through the kitchen and that's actually your workspace? While each of these workplace, workplace environments are important to the employee experience, in today's workplace, flexibility is also a key part of the employee experience. Requiring employees to be back in the office when they sp spend the entire day either working by themselves or on Zoom or in team calls all day long does not make for a great employee experience. For others, they don't have the environment at home that's conducive to working from home. And for them, they don't want to work remotely. So being flexible is important. I advise my clients to analyze the work that needs to be done and the environment that best serves each individual for that productivity. Sometimes it's gonna be heads down work done at a home office, at other times it requires meeting with people in the office. Giving the employees the flexibility that they need to deliver on their business objectives and meeting their personal needs is really what's best for the employee experience. That's what it's all about today. When employees do come into the office, it is about creating those moments that matter. Helping employees connect with their manager, with their teammates, and importantly, with those cross-functional teams that they need to build relationships with to spark creativity and to get work done. I wanna talk about the culture next, the employee experience is really driven by what managers do and say, what they recognize and what they reward. It's about the policies that you have that limit or encourage employee autonomy, risk-taking, innovation, and self-determination. It's about how easy it is to get things done versus the level of bureaucracy that slows progress. Only about a quarter of employees today feel connected to their company's culture. And that is the manager's job. Managers need to live the company's norms, values, and beliefs in their day-to-day -day behaviors. They need to reinforce that culture, not just by how they treat others, but how, how they hold confidences and how they deliver on what was promised and also what they recognize and reward. For example, a collaborative culture drives a positive employee experience because employees aren't pitted against one another in a competitive manner, but they're encouraged to work together to achieve common goals. To the extent that your company's recognition and reward systems and manager behavior reinforce those behaviors, that will drive a culture of collaboration. But I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Culture does not exist in your office. 
It's the behaviors that managers role model, recognize, and reward. And that which gets measured and rewarded is what gets done. So if you want to improve the employee experience in your company, you have to measure it, you have to take action on key learnings, and go back and measure again. Most importantly, you have to hold your managers accountable to their role in the employee experience which I think I've shown how very important the manager role is. So I started with this question, why is the employee experience important? Let me share some great statistics that you can share with your leaders to build your business case for developing your employee experience. Organizations that invest in the employee experience are 11 and a half, times as often on Glassdoor's best places to work. They're 4.4 times as often on LinkedIn's North American's most in-demand employers. They are four times more profitable. That'll get your leadership's attention. They are twice as often on Forbes' list of the world's most innovative companies. They are twice as often on America's customer satisfaction index and they're likely to grow one and a half times faster. So HR's blueprint for designing a winning employee experience is about these six factors. Think about them at every stage of the employee life cycle and you will be well on your way to success. You can certainly count on me to help you and your organization master every aspect of the design map to create an employee experience that will help you to attract, motivate, and retain your best talent. Thank you. And it's time for questions. So you guys, if you haven't put a question in the chat, go ahead and enter those now. I'd love to, um, I'd love to chat with you all and hear what's going on. We did have a question earlier that um, I, I did forget to say, but um, as far as listening goes, what are the pros and cons of radical honesty? Mm. So some of you may have read Karen Scott's book called Radical Candor. Um, you know, it, this is really going to be culture dependent within your organization. Radical Candor has, you know, there are two elements to it. One is being honest, but it's coming, it's where you're coming from. It's this place of doing it with empathy and with a 100% desire to help somebody else be more successful. It's not about being honest to drag them down or to criticize. It's really the space that you're coming from. I tell a story. People like can't believe I tell the story. It's a very honest story. Early, much earlier in my career, I was giving a presentation to an executive team, and my client um, gave me feedback afterwards about using um and okay, right? Those space fillers that we often use. And he said, it makes you sound like an idiot. <laughs> And I was a little taken aback at the time, but you know what? I had such a close relationship with that person. I know he told me that because he wanted it to make an impact and he did it because he wanted me to be more successful in the future. And I took that feedback and I hope that I did not use um during this conversation. Wow. That is, and, and those conversations, those are, we, you know, had a conversation, we had difficult conversations earlier today. So we just learned about how to be self-aware about how feedback can affect us. So that's very good that you just added that on there. I do have another question. I find it can be difficult for leaders to translate outputs from engagement and pulse surveys into actual actions and accountability. Have you found any effective ways to help leaders respond to feedback that they get in surveys? You know, it's about having that conversation with managers about the importance of taking this to heart and that it's not just employees being mean, but perception is reality. And uh, you may not intend to be perceived a particular way. I know I'm working with an organization and 
Uh, managers are kind of well known for not liking to get the feedback that they get. Um, but, in, you know, as I said, particularly with uh, Gen Z employees, they really want their voices heard. And if you're not taking their feedback into account, it's um, it's disheartening to them. I mean, that's really part of this employee experience. So working with your managers to understand we're asking these questions because we expect you to take action and you may not like the feedback that you're getting, but this is where a strong relationship between the HR team supporting those managers um, can really help overcome some of that concern some of it that's taken as criticism and really moving to the action planning. Okay, so if this is a perception, let's say you don't think that's true, but if this is the perception, then what, what steps might you take to change that perception? Because it's reality. Mm -hmm. And then we had another request. Would you be able to show the measure and iterate chart? Yes. Let me get back up here. Uh, share screen again, right? Measure and iterate. Take a screenshot of it, but we will be sending out slides so everyone will receive this as well um, on a mini site that you can access at any time. Um, if you have any other questions, now is the perfect time to put those in. I know that was a lot of information, but this is going to give you the, the right plan that you need to move forward to, to see progress. And we're really interested in hearing your feedback as well. So after this, we are going to send out a survey. I hope you'll respond and let us know what you thought about this session. Right. We're going to listen. And feedback's really important to me. So I'll be asking her for that feedback. So please do be sure to fill out that assessment. Awesome. And then everybody, thank you so much for attending with us today. I want you to know that we have one more session uh, left. It is the roadmap session. It'll only be about 30 minutes long, but I will be announcing our winners for today's Stanley mug giveaway. So please be sure to attend. So the last chance you have to, to get all of your questions answered. And of course, we will be following up with you uh, with more information. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time and we'll see you later. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.